and I will finish eating my sandwich. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, welcome once again to the Environment and Transportation Committee. I am, as always, your friendly chairman, Kumar Barbe. I believe I am joined, or I will be joined by the equally friendly vice chairman, Dana Stein. Oh no, wait, actually, Dana Stein has to be in the Ways and Means Committee, so he is cruelly snubbing us uh, for a few minutes. So in any case, um, members of my committee, uh, and we're welcoming Steve Connolly and Kim Rice, who are going to talk to us about the spotted lanternfly, uh, a creature that is devastating our um, farmland and, but at least, you know, DNR gave us all this really neat spotted lanternfly swag. So every time I open a jar in my kitchen, it's a um, jar opener that says we need to stop the spotted lanternfly and I get to open up the can of ragu. So there's that. So, okay, Steve, take it away. The, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um... <laughs> I think this briefing may have come about because uh, a conversation I had with Delegate Jacobs. Um, yes, I, I meant to thank Delegate Jacobs for bringing this to our attention. And we're going to have other briefings every now and again as we can fit them in at the request of members of my committee. But uh, thanks, Jay. And go ahead. Forgive me for uh, interrupting. That's, that's fine. You're the chairman. You can do uh, as you like, actually. Uh, I'll try not to abuse that power. Uh, any, anyhow, I, I actually live in Cecil County and uh, have had a major uh, spotted lanternfly infestation uh, at my home. It, it, it is a problem for uh, agriculture, especially grape growers and, and fruit growers, but it is a major nuisance if you're a homeowner that has uh, uh, um, trees near your house because of the uh, excretion of honeydew and, and uh, uh black sooty mold that gets on things and just it's just really a, a nuisance. But Kim's going to walk through a PowerPoint for you to kind of explain uh, where um, uh, the insect came from. It's a non-native uh, invasive species and uh, kind of its march across Maryland or st its start of its march across Maryland. And I hope um, anyhow, Kim's going to start to, uh, to go through this. And Kim Rice is a program manager. Uh, for plant protection, and uh, she's kind of in charge of of uh, taking care of the uh, uh, or, uh, trying to control invasive species. So, how, how do we get? Uh... Um, Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, we're I'm on a new computer. I don't quite know how this works. Oh, that's never happened to any of us. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's. No. I I don't know where I don't know how. Sorry, that's really loud. No, they have they have a copy. Okay. Of it. Can can you see the copy? Um. No, probably no. Not. Okay. Are you guys, is more than one person trying to share the screen? Or is it just you guys? Uh, it's one computer. Oh, um, I have it, I have it set for one participant at a time. <clears throat> oh. Yeah. Um, I don't know if everyone has a copy of the presentation in front of them. I can start. Um, and Why don't you go ahead and start and uh, we'll catch <laughs> up to you figure it out on our end. Yeah. Um, so the spotted lanternfly <laughs> is a plant hopper and it is native to China, India, and Vietnam. Um, it feeds on at least 80 different plant species. 
Um, and its preferred host is the Lampus Altisma, which is Tree of Heaven, which is another invasive uh, <laughs> weed species here in Maryland, pretty much all over the country. It showed up in Pennsylvania in 2014. Um, it likely came in on landscape pavers as egg masses. Um, that's what their best guess is. It showed up in Berks County. Um, the third slide, it shows you the life cycle of the spotted lanternfly. And so right now we have one generation per year in Maryland and we are in the egg, egg mass stage. Um, so if you're in an area that has spotted lanternfly, you would see these egg masses probably on lots of different things. Um, they have four instars. The first three are the black and white. Um, they move pretty quick. Then you get the red ones and that's when the phone calls start because people see them and then we move into the adults. Um, Slide four just gives you kind of an idea of what plants are affected by spotted lanternfly. This is by no means a full list. Um, it's more um, of what we see here. Um, and of course, grape is probably one of the ones that we're most concerned about in the ag industry. Um, as far as damage, it's known to weaken plants. It chews on their, it sucks on the sap of the plants. Um, so some of like the grape growers, especially in in Pennsylvania, where it has been the longest, have seen losses in um, fruit production um, and in yield. Um, it also excretes honeydew, so which is just the sticky, sugary secretion. Um, it promotes sooty mold, and when it lands on plants on the understory, it stops photosynthesis because it's black on these plants and it can kill them. It's also just um, a terrible nuisance. Um, the next slide for movement, um, it's a great hitchhiker. So we have found probably in Maryland, some of our newest populations have come in on uh, vehicles, um, railway lines. That's a big one. They move all along the railway lines. Our infestation in Washington County, you can kind of track it along the railway lines. Um, and it also moves in plant material. Um, the adults and the egg masses are the best movers. Um, there's a map uh, to let you know where it is right now. Um, it's in 10 plus states, um, sort of all along the mid-Atlantic, up into Connecticut, as far west as Indiana. <clears throat> in Maryland, uh, presently we know of it in 10 counties and Baltimore City. Um, it showed up in Anne Arundel County in 2021 along the northern edge of that county, especially around BWI. Um, it's in Baltimore County. Much of that county has small populations along the northern end. It's probably <laughs> come in, down from Pennsylvania. Um, Towson University at their stadium, they have a small population, so it probably came in on a car. Um, Gunpowder State Park. Baltimore City, we're finding it along the I-95 corridor. Um, and we've had a few uh, sightings through the city that we're looking into. Carroll County, uh, 2021 again. Most of these uh, we found this year. New Windsor, Sykesville area. Cecil yeah. County. Um, the entire county's invested, I'm afraid. Uh, Frederick County, New Windsor area again. Um, but we've also found, heard it, had some sightings in Frederick in the city itself. Um, Hartford County. Uh, we would say the entire county is invested. Howard County, it showed up this year along the northern edge. Kent County, uh, we found that in 2019. It's along Route 301 and some in the Chestertown area. Uh, Montgomery County, we found it in the Clarksburg area this year. And finally, Washington County, we found it in 2020 uh, near Hagerstown. It runs along the major highways, including I-81 and Route 11, which, fly, which moves into Pennsylvania. Um, the next couple of slides are just some maps that I was going to show, and it just sort of shows the progression through the state as we've done some visual surveys. Um, so we'll skip through those, and then I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the quarantine that we have in place. In 2019, we quarantined Cecil and Harford County. Um, this year, on January 22nd, we added Anne Arundel, Baltimore, Carroll, Frederick, Howard, Kent, Montgomery, and Washington counties, along with Baltimore City. Um, that's a total of 10 counties uh, with Baltimore City. Um, 
There's also a map included, which should be about slide 14 on your notes. Um, and that just gives you an idea of the counties. And as you can see, it's sort of all the counties along the northern edge of the border of Pennsylvania. And it's just moving south as we go. Um, the main points of the uh, quarantine are that uh, we require the re permits and we are restricting movement of uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, so if you have a business in any of the counties that have been quarantined, we and you move with vehicles and you're moving around, um, we require a permit. Um, it is a sort of a train the trainer course. Um, we allow one person in the business to take the course and then they can train other people. And we ask that the permit be in the vehicle with them. Um, slide 16 is sort of just a screenshot of the permitting test. So to get- Can, the can, permit, I, can, can I interrupt you for a yeah, second? Absolutely. Uh, Trish, I mean, what's, what, what, is, what is the problem here with, with this? Do you know? With the pres sharing their presentation? Yeah. Um, it's not on our end. Um, yeah. I mean, do you think it would be beneficial for them to get off and get back on? Could we get off and get back on? And we, we could. Why don't we try that? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Can you That'd give us like two minutes, maybe? That'd be fine. Thank you. I also sent the, the full presentation out to the full committee. Did you? It's also okay. available on the committee webpage. Oh, all right. It's available on the hearing schedule. If only I knew how to get to the committee webpage. Uh, <laughs> Somebody's in trouble. Uh, oh, check yeah. your email. I just sent it to your email. Okay. Um, uh, MDA presentation. Well, what do you know? Well, there we go. Huh, you know, it's kind of cool looking. Well, uh, uh, hopefully they'll be able to log back on and we'll be able to do this so that if, if there's somebody from the public viewing this, they'll benefit from that as well. But if in the likely case that nobody from the public is watching, then Okay, well. <clears throat> also, I'll send it to Ben and see if Ben can share it. Okay. Yeah, let me give me a minute on that. Let me see if I can do it. See, it's easy for me because I've got two screens and I've got this up on my um, personal laptop now. Here we go. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. Let me go to speaker view. Oh, okay. That, Does that work? That Can you see that it? Works. Yay, <laughs> yes. There it is. Okay, so I will move through these really quick. We kind of already talked about all this. This is the spider lantern fly. It is a plant hopper. Here's your generations per year, right? As I said, we're in the egg stage, October to June. Pretty hard to see if you're down the infested areas, you can't miss them, but plants are feeding damage. Here's how they move. Um, they're really great hitchhikers. We have to be really careful when we're doing our work to make sure we don't bring any back to Annapolis. Mm -hmm. um, here's the map I was talking about. So this is where they are in the country. The red outlines are counties that have quarantines in place right now. Um, and the blue is where they have found populations. So as I said, we're all the way out to Indiana, into Massachusetts, down to the border of North Carolina and Virginia. Okay. Um, here's where they're located in Maryland. So here's some maps. I just wanted to see, let you see 
and 19. So when people call in and they think they see them, here's 2019, 2020. Cecil and Harford County were full. Last year, you can really see where it really increased, especially in Washington County, kind of moved across the state. Quarantine. Here's our quarantine map. So these are the counties that are under quarantine presently. Here's our permit. And this is what it would look like if you were to take the quiz and pass, you would get one of these. And then you would leave these in your car. So as you're moving around through the quarantine, um, you would have that available to you. This is the um, site on Penn State's website. So you would just Google spotted lantern flag quiz, and then this would come up. You want to take the Maryland exam, and then you would get, once you pass, you'll get your permit. Uh, the big thing with our, our uh, quarantine is that we are regulating the movement of certain articles. Here they are, life stages, plant parts, outdoor industrial construction material, packing containers, outdoor household articles, conveyances, any kind of vehicle, and any other product that might carry spotted lanternfly. An important uh, point is that Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Virginia also have quarantines. Our permit is reciprocal with those states. Same with them with us. So if you have a permit in Pennsylvania, it's good for Maryland. To date, we've issued 614 permits in 19 states and three provinces in Canada. There's your list. We also do trapping. Originally, we used bug barrier traps, which are sticky on the inside, um, but they catch more non-targets than we would like. Um, they don't have a great field life, um, and we, we aren't using those anymore. We have moved to the circle traps. Um, they catch a lot of SLF, especially the adults. They catch a lot less bycatch. Um, we can use them in highly infested areas, and they're much easier for our staff to use. Those bug barrier traps were super sticky, and getting this back to the lab was a little tough. Um, so this is just gives you an idea of um, total traps. So every year we started trapping in 18 and every year our numbers go up and in correlation so to our positive numbers. That's sort of how it works. So we started in four counties. Last year we trapped in 13 counties. We tend to start early April, mid-May, late April, mid-May, depending on the temperature because that's how they'll emerge. We trap for all four instars and the adults. Once we have our first hard frost, the adults will die and we aren't trapping anymore. I see a question. Well, let's get all the way, let's get all oh, you the way to go to the, the end? presentation. Okay. Yeah, and then, yeah, we'll, sure. then we'll entertain um, questions. Okay, so here real quick are some trapping maps. Again, just to give you an idea of where we're trapping. So the red are our positive traps, the green are our negative. So in 19, these are our traps. Cecil and Harper County fully invested. In 2020, again, once we have counties that are fully infested, we tend to put up a little less trapping in those counties because we know it's there. So you, you, have, trap, you have traps in DC? Um, they're actually just outside along the border. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, in uh, Hagerstown, we had our first positive. So 21, last year, as you can see, a lot more red throughout the state. Um, we also do a delimiting survey. So once we find positives, we go a quarter mile around those positives and we're looking for any more positives. We work with USDA. We put that data into a GIS program and then that allows us to determine population sizes and treatment areas. So in the past, uh, we have done some treatments in Maryland. All have been done by USDA. MDA hasn't done any treatments yet, but we plan to in 21, or 22, sorry, we're in 2022 already. Uh, we require treatment control orders to be signed by property owners. The USDA treatments, if they're treating only Alanthus, the tree of heaven, if the tree is six inches and in larger in DBH, they get an insecticide. <clears throat> if they are smaller, they use an herbicide. We plan on starting egg mass treatments uh, in late winter, early spring of this year, we will use golden pest spray oil. The problem with that is it has to be at least 40 degrees or warmer. So we haven't had very good days for that yet. So we're hoping to get that started. Um, 
we plan on targeting our travel sites um, and our rail lines because we know those are really easy hitchhiker areas for movement. Um, so this is just some data on our treatment program. Um, so these are the herbicide treated and the insecticide treated plants. Um, in 2021, um, USDA did not do any herbicide treatments. They only did insecticide treatments. Um, so we get a lot of um, inquiries here at the agency. Um, we have an email set up specifically <laughs> for Spotted Lanternfly. And this year we added an online portal. So that helps us in mapping the sightings. So if someone um, in the public sees a Spotted Lanternfly, they can go to our website. They click on the very bottom reported online here. That gives us a GIS point. And so we can follow up to see if we um, are interested in going back. If they have sent us something from Cecil, Harford County, we probably won't follow up because we know it's there. And we appreciate the information, but it's, it's everywhere there. So as you can see, our inquiries have grown uh, exponentially wow. here in the past um, couple of years. Um, the over 6,000 just on that link this year, once we set it up. So people are using it. We get a lot of people that are really good and they use it every day. If they see it in their backyard, they're letting us know they're seeing it. So it's very helpful to us. This is just a quick map to let you know all the inquiries we've gotten just from July to December, 2021. And as you can see all over the state. Um, so people have seen dead adults in Salisbury. So we go and we look. We have not found anything there. It likely fell off a car. Um, the same for like Ocean City. Um, so we always follow up, but we haven't found any in those areas yet, any populations. So this is just a little quick information on our funding and our staffing. We started off in 18 with receiving a little less than 100,000. Um, in 2021, we received 483,000. We have requested a little over a million for 2022. Um, we have not heard what we'll be getting this year. I have been told late February, early March. Um, all of our funding comes from PPA, the Plant Protection Act 7721 through USDA, which is formerly the Farm Bill. We have two full-time employees, both entomologists. Presently, we have eight contractual employees. Um, we are always hiring seasonal staff. Um, there's quite a turnover and we always need more. So we just let people know how can you help. Um, we ask you to be vigilant if you see it. We always tell people to squash it. Um, let us know, take pictures, send us an email. If it's dead, that's even better. Um, right now we tell people that if they see egg masses to scrape those egg masses put them in alcohol or hand sanitizer. Putting them in the freezer doesn't always work. Um, they've done research on that and they've pulled them out of the freezer and they will emerge. So we always tell people, smash them, put them in alcohol um, to get rid of them. That is all I have. Sorry about the uh, issues earlier. Oh, that, that's totally fine. Okay, <laughs> first question goes to Delegate Jacobs. Okay. Here I am, I guess. I can't see yeah. me on the screen to un unmute it, but I did. I think I'm unmuted. You are. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for having the briefing. And uh, and thank you, uh, Steve and Kim, for putting this together pretty quick. Um, you know, I've got a number of questions. I think, was it 2017? Is that when the uh, lanternfly first emerged? In Maryland, it showed up in 18. It showed up in Pennsylvania initially in 2014. It, that was when it was the uh, larvae under the uh, landscape? It was the egg masses on the, in Pennsylvania. They think that's how it came in, yes. Right, right. Kirk's so, so I guess it was probably 17 or 18. We started talking about it in Maryland and it, when uh, Claire Pierfos was on the chopping blocks and we kind of kept it alive for a year or so because it was a 
one of the one of the uh, uses that was suggested at the time, and, and since then it's been banned. And, and uh, I see you're using a couple of products, this uh, pet uh, pest spray oil and, and whatnot. But it looks like with all the proliferation, that nothing's working too well. So it's it's you know when when Steve talked about killing ten thousand on his property, I mean that's what kind of sparked me into this asking to have this briefing because we went from seeing a few in 18 to to you can't walk across St steve's backyard you know <laughs> and i know that i've heard in delaware uh glasgow delaware you know which is right across the cecil line uh if you go in that home depot park lot or whatever that you have to sweep them off your vehicles when you come out that they're so thick in that particular area and that's right there on the cecil line so i mean we we've got a real problem here and, and i didn't hear anything about affecting hardwoods is there is there any evidence that they may affect woods you know or, or hardwood trees or whatnot because i know that it's a real threat to apple orchards that are very very much so part of cecil county and also um the grape grapevines and you know we've done a heck of a job in maryland of promoting the wine industry in maryland i certainly wouldn't want to see um you know that industry affected in a negative way by these lanterns fly so you know that's why i wanted to see the the, the presentation it really so everybody could understand the magnitude of what's going on um so is there evidence that that it's going to harm the hardwoods or or any other kind of trees? I have not heard of any research that said that it's <laughs> killing any hardwood trees. It will feed on them. Um, and it is really more of a nuisance. It's, and in the vineyard industry in Pennsylvania, some vineyards have lost vines. Uh, not all, they tend to start sort of on the outside of the vineyard. And so that's where, um, the, uh, where they have to do more spraying. They are fairly easy to kill. Uh, you know, a, 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 just an over-the-counter insecticide will kill them, but you have to be vigilant because you can go in, do a spray, and they will be back probably within 24 to 48 hours. And so sometimes you, you have to follow, your, you know, your labels and you can't spray again for a while. So you have to be vigilant. Um, and I know that Penn State is doing a lot of work with vineyards and the growers uh, to help them. Um, to deal with that. So it's certainly, we have found it in some of our vineyards. So we're working. Right. So one more question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Um, sure. You talked about the quarantine and quite a few counties now are under quarantine. And then there was a list of products that building products and landscape products and all that. If you're carrying them across state lines, I guess, is that what is that what you're talking about? Because, um, you know, especially right there, I mean, I, every one of my counties border tax-free Delaware and um, especially Cecil County and, you know, it's right there on the in, on the Delaware border. And, and a lot of people go across the line to sh shop to try to save taxes. Sure. So. It, it doesn't, it's it, not for the. I'm just trying to understand is there sure. something we should understand about quarantine and about what we should be instructing our constituents that live in these areas that cross these these uh, county boundaries or even state boundaries and, and purchase some of these products that were on that list? Sure. So I think the biggest part of the quarantine for us is that it's a huge educational tool. It lets people know what a spotted lantern fly is and how it moves. And so the quarantine is specific to businesses. We don't hold homeowners to the quarantine. We do have checklists on our website that help homeowners if they're moving things around so they know what they're looking for. Um, as far as Delaware, where you're located, Delegate Jacobs, those counties in Delaware and Pennsylvania are also quarantined. So if there are businesses specifically moving around, um, they should have a permit. Um, if there's landscapers out there that are moving between Cecil County and Newcastle County and working, they need to have a spotted lanternfly permit. And again, it's really an educational tool. There are um, you know, penalties involved, but we're not looking at that. We want people to be educated so that we can really slow the spread. 
I will be honest, we are never getting rid of spotted lanternfly. It is going to be here with us and we were going to have to deal with it. But if we could slow it down, uh, I think that is the, what we're striving for. Um, so um, we can keep it in the areas it's in for now. I know it's gonna move, but um, that's sort of how we look at the quarantine. We've worked with county agencies um, so that they can get permitted. Um, we are we will give training to people. You know, if anybody, if businesses have questions, we always ask. Um, and you know, we try to hit those industrial sites. Um, we have those large Amazon facilities. Um, a lot of truck drivers in and out, so we're working with them also to try to get them uh, permitted. And again, it's really the education of it, so they're not moving it. And I appreciate the you know all this. It's it's just. It was really hard to believe that that they have mag the, the magnitude of of the problem in in that area, but and I really do appreciate your presentation today. And I got more questions, but I see a lot of my colleagues with their hands up, and I'll I'll pass for now. Uh, and uh, I'll let you have another bite. I'll let you have another bite at the apple there, Jay. Don't worry. Um, if the, that is if the spotted lantern fly doesn't get there first to the apple. Okay, uh, Delegate Healy has the next question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is about, you, you talk about education and outreach. Are you doing anything with the schools or with any of the youth groups? Uh, young people, young children are love to find things and report them and enlisting them to be the eyes and ears is probably something that will also make them into conservationists and environmentalists as well. So uh, do you have outreach to the schools and to like the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts and those kind of groups? We don't, but that's an excellent idea. And I, I think part of the problem with our outreach, of course, is the pandemic and we were kind of restricted, but I think that's an excellent idea and I will absolutely pass that along to my staff. I think that's a great way to get like the kids, once they find this bug and know it's bad, they love that because they can just go out and squash and, it. So. And you can, and I mean, schools, we have hundreds of thousands of students and in, in, in we have more than 130,000 students in Prince George's County. Uh, just having, just having the fourth graders look, you know, have some, a unit for the teachers to do something with that, I think would be so great. That's a great idea. I'll work with them, our extension agents. They do a lot of work too. So I'll see if they've, they've reached out as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that's good. That's a great suggestion. And next question goes to Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I wanna thank you all for this presentation. It's been very helpful and frightening, but um, so my questions have, some of them have been answered and sort of changed in the, the previous discussions. Um, so I, I think I understand the quarantine and I just wanna make sure I understand the the quarantine is basically this permit that's required for businesses. Is that correct? That's the big thing, yes. That's what we're working towards in the educational pool so that they are moving it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. If I could just sure. add, uh, I actually have a permit. Uh, I went through the education online at Penn State early on. It took about an, an hour, but it was really tells about the life cycle of the, um, the spotted lantern fly, what to look for on your vehicle or, or the material that you may be moving so that if you can spot egg masses and to make sure that you're not spreading it. So it's, it's as Kim has said, it's really an educational tool and it's not that difficult. If I could do it, I think anybody can. Great, thank you. Um, I also wanted to, to second Delegate Healy's suggestion. I think that's a great suggestion as well. Um, you, you said the spotted lanternfly is, we're not gonna get rid of it. It's gonna be with us, but we're trying to slow the spread. And that sounds an awful lot like COVID. Um, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm just wondering, is is slowing the spread a similar thing where we're trying to slow it so we can get a better handle on it? Um, and what's the the long-term prospects for how we're gonna deal with this? So I think that's- Unfortunately, they're not filling up the emergency room. So there's that. That is good. <laughs> Go ahead, Kim. Um, I think that is absolutely part of it. So we want to slow it so that the researchers have some time to actually figure out what is the best way to, to deal with it. They're looking at biocontrol. Um, USDA does that. But as you know, that can take six to eight years with the environmental assessments that have to go through. So they've already, USDA has already been to China. They have received some biocontrol agents and they're working on those in the labs, but that takes a lot of time. Um, so if we can keep it to this area before it you know, kind of marches across the country, 
Um, certainly California isn't interested at all because of their huge vineyard industry. So, you know, we are just working to keep it, to slow it down, keep it from moving as much as we can. That that makes sense. Um, my last question, do you have social media materials you can share with us that we can share with our constituents? Sure, absolutely. I can send great. you anything. Yeah, we have stuff. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, Delegate Silberti. You need to unmute yourself, my man. <laughs> um, Barry, you need to unmute yourself. Do we have the ability to, ah, there we go. Oh, he's muted again. There we go. There we go. Okay. There we go. Well, thanks, Kim, for bringing this uh, to our attention. No, no question. Uh, number one, uh, does this beast have a predator? Good question. Not really. Um, there are, you know, some birds will eat it. They've seen a prey mantis eat it here or there. I think the problem is, is that it's invasive. And so since it didn't uh, kind of grow up with our native pests, some mm. of them, they haven't found it yet. I mean, it could be eventually we'll find, you know, we'll find something that keys in on it. Um, there are some, I think, some small wasps out there that might lay their eggs on the um, eggs of the spotted lanternfly. But again, it's not nearly enough to, to see any kind of change in population numbers. Yeah. Okay. Secondly, uh, what's the shelf life for these things? How, 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 do they, how long do they exist? My point. Shelf so we have one, gener one generation per year. The first instars will start to emerge early May. They will survive and become an adult late August, September. They will stick around until we have a hard frost. Um, so we have found them into December. Um, so, you know, once that hard frost hits, they're gonna die off, but the egg masses are already there and they're gonna sit all winter. So. So uh, mother nature's our predator, frost. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting to see. To me, it's been a colder winter this year. So we'll see if anything changes. I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Delegate Terraza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, sorry to keep going back to, I'm still not understanding the quarantine. <laughs> so I'm looking at the list of regulated, so I'm looking off to the side because that's where I have my list, but of the regulated articles and it has like packaging, it has like boxes and stuff. And it also has vehicles not stored indoors. And I don't understand. Like, so for example, I live in one of the counties with a quarantine. I have a vehicle that I don't store indoors. So, so I, I must be missing something. <laughs> we're targeting businesses only. Okay. So as a homeowner, you would not be included in the quarantine. However, we would love it if you would look before you drive somewhere. Um, but it's businesses only. And we were trying... Our quarantine mimics Pennsylvania's quarantine, New Jersey's quarantine, Delaware's quarantine, and Virginia. We're almost exactly the same because we wanted to make sure everybody is on the same page. Um, so we wanted to hit as many articles as we could sort of think of that businesses might be moving around um, to make sure that they're looking at those things uh, for any type of life stage before they move it if they're in a quarantined area. Okay, um, let me see that ahead. And the harm they do, and this has been very helpful, by the way, I really appreciate this presentation. Um, and the harm, can, can you go back to the harm that they do? They do harm to vineyards and they do harm to other crops, or can you just, can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. So spotted lanternfly are sap suckers. They, um, they suck the sap out of the plant. So for vineyards specifically along the vines, they can reduce the fruit uh, yield and quality. Um, they have been known in Pennsylvania to kill some vines um, if they were constantly coming in and, and sucking the sap on the same vines. Um, the same for, for fruit trees, um, although we have not seen them kill any of those types of trees. We haven't seen them kill hardwoods. There's an issue with understories, so especially in forested areas, because if they're, as adults, they move up the trees and as they're feeding, they're sending out their honeydew that's landing on the understory. And when that turns black and it's landed on the leaves underneath, photosynthesis can occur. So those plants can die. And they have seen that some in Pennsylvania. Um, I think Steve said he saw it at his house. So we are looking at that. Um, and it and it's more of a nuisance as well. You know, if you were in a fully infested area, yeah, 
you have plant, you have a tree over your deck in the summertime, you're probably not going to want to sit on your deck. I didn't like cicadas, so I'm very <laughs> positive I wouldn't like these, but I was just wondering if there's something else I could describe to my constituents and explaining why they're dangerous or problematic. Thank you so much for this presentation. You're welcome. Okay, um, Delegate Healy has another question. And you need to mute, unmute yourself. I forgot to take my hand down. Okay. Oh, <laughs> is that it? Oh, okay. Uh, Delegate Otto. Thank you. Thank you, Steve and Kim, for being here. And uh, uh, this being a sap sucker, it, can it spread the disease from uh, vineyard to vineyard or something? That uh... Not that I know of. I'm sure the researchers are looking at that. I am not a researcher, but I, I can, I'm sure they're looking at it, but I have not heard of that specifically. Well, I, I know what aphids do and things of uh, spreading disease around field crops. So. Sure. Okay, thank you, Delegate Otto. Delegate uh, Jacobs, do you have uh, more questions? I did have a couple. Go um, for it. Um, first of all, could we train the stink bug to be a predator? <laughs> or a competitor? <laughs> that would be even better. Um, <clears throat> but uh, getting back to the uh, infestation in Cecil County, um, how can we, is there any way we can combat this, just this massive amount that's, that's in, you know, crossing into Cecil and, and some of these other areas? I mean, besides the nuisance of the honeydew, whatever, whatever I mean, is there, what can the average person do to, to help cut down on this just so it doesn't have this massive amount, like, what you talked about, Steve, like you'd kill 10,000 or something. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to envision that. Uh, it's pretty hard. Um, you know, we, we always tell people, if you see them, squash them. Um, I know when you have thousands of them, that's almost an impossible thing. Um, we have a staff member here that has a, a wet back and she goes out to the trees every night and sucks them off the tree. Um, I, I can't ask, you know, homeowners to do that, but I mean, I think you have to be kind of clever. You have to think about it. You, most insecticides, even the kind you can buy at the local Lowe's, will kill them. Um, but there are just so many. Um, and so, you know, I think for us, like pushing the research, getting that information um, as quickly as we can, I know it takes time, but I think that is going to be the key to any type of population uh, reduction. Uh, for us. I mean, they can put up traps. The traps that we use, you can purchase online. Um, and some homeowners have done that and it helps to reduce those numbers. But they have to, like I said, you have to be vigilant. You have to go out every day. You have to empty that trap. You have to, so it, it, takes, it takes some work, sadly. Well, I, I thank you personally. I thank you very much for doing this presentation. And Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for uh, allowing it to happen. I think it's been informative to the committee. And, you know, we've in, in four or five short years, we've seen this thing explode. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I really want everybody to understand. And I appreciate uh, letting this happen. Yeah, not at all. I, I actually have a question, um, Kim. So if this were to, if I had a backyard and it were to turn up in my backyard, uh, I mean, do we have an official um, position? Does ag have a official uh, statement of what kind of chemicals are safe to use and safe and effective to use um, uh, on this critter? So generally when people start asking about us about insecticides, we work with extension and they have some information and we send them there. Um, I don't have anything specific that I could tell you. I mean, bifenthrin will kill it, seven will kill it. But as far as like me telling a homeowner, we generally tend send them to the websites uh, and they have homeowner information and they have some really great information on what's the best way. I mean, some, you know, just a uh, liquid, like a Dawn dish soap and, and water mixture will kill them. They really they aren't just that spray, hardy. You just spraying it on them. <laughs> yeah. really? And that's one of the things we do at my house during when they're in the, the, their uh, smaller stages, uh, when they're the black and white uh, colored, we have a spray bottle with the uh, Dawn, uh, detergent and uh, water, and you'll spray them, and that will kill them. 
What ratio? Once they become adults, there's just so many of them that that's yeah. not what rate? What ratio? How much uh, detergent to water? Uh, 50 50, maybe? I, I, it wasn't even that much. Yeah. I think it was uh, 10 to 1, maybe. It wasn't a great amount. It, it just dries them out when they're in their, uh, you know, they're in the next stage. And I'm sure it's not the right term. No, I mean, it is. You, you got it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what, Kim, if you could. Uh, send that link to the committee and we can disseminate that to the members because it's starting to look to me like this is going to be a pest throughout the state of Maryland. Yes. And uh, it might be a useful con uh, uh, constituent service to be able to direct people to the uh, link um, so that, uh, people can take care of this in them. You know, obviously, I like the idea of the Dawn liquid because that's about as benign to, you know, uh, humans and pets and other, you know, creatures as you can possibly conceive of. If that works for the early stage, then that's a good thing. It looks like Delegate Silberti has a question. Uh, Barry, you need to unmute yourself there. Barry? Yes. There okay. you go. Uh, well, um, I was single for a number, number of years, and my go-to for either cleaning or killing was Clorox. So I'm wondering, and I'm serious now, uh, spraying Clorox on this, uh, this animal or whatever it is should do it. It does it for everything else. It should, but I don't know about the pH levels, and, and I, I don't know how you would combine that with the water. We'd have to look at that. Probably so uh, at least the good thing is that unlike the cockroaches, these buggers will not survive nuclear war. So that's a good thing, right? Yeah. The egg masses might, but not the <laughs> Yeah. And, and the, one of the nuisance factors, as you know, Kim mentioned before, is the, the, the uh, sooty mold that grows on the honeydew that may drip on you, but it drips on your railings and your deck. And it actually, I've, been in the woods behind my house and uh, a, a lot of the undergrowth is is dead because the sooty mold grew on the undergrowth including mm. native plants like pawpaw trees and they're just they're dying because they you know they can't get any sunlight to keep them alive mm. it's oh hold it okay any other questions for oh go ahead uh, delegate Silberti. no i was not joking when it came to clorox Okay. Nothing survives that. Seriously, you should try that. Get get some Clorox spray. Don't use the water. Go straight to it, and nail I it. I find it. I find it amusing that your wife has uh, uh, terminated your use of Clorox in that fashion. You this said when true. you were saying, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, sometimes <laughs> you're a master of the house. Sometimes you're not. <laughs> Does gotcha. she use it on you? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, Delegate Terraza, uh, do you have a question? Well, I don't have a question, but I was going to ask the question the delegate Healy asked in the chat, which was because I want to not know the answer to this, but are they edible? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw that. I don't think so. I, I have heard uh, anecdotally, like people will catch them and throw them out to their chickens to eat and the chickens won't even eat them. So um, I, the tree of heaven has some chemicals in the, in that tree itself. Um, that when they think when it gets into the spotted land spine to the gut, it's just not very appetizing to most any creature. So um, I don't think that I, I don't think I'd want to eat one. I'm positive I wouldn't, <laughs> but thank you for the answer. <laughs> sure. Okay, so on that um, uh, unsettling note, I think we're going to end the public briefing. Uh, thank you, Kim and uh, Steve. Thank you very much for doing this briefing. And uh, to the members of the committee, we are going to have occasional briefings on other topics as well. So, uh, um, okay, so that's it. Are there any announcements of my subcommittee uh, chairs uh, before we sign off? Uh, any announcements? Uh, anybody? No, uh, Delegate Lehman has her hand up for an announcement, I assume, right? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not an announcement. It's actually a question for you. Um, I was wondering if you are open to suggestions on briefing topics and how much notice you need and information. I, I, am, I am open to it, but we are very rapidly getting into the part of the session where we're going to have a lot of bills. And I think that that, and that of course is going to be our top priority. So okay. 
Uh, so yeah, definitely run it by me, but don't, but if, but if I say no to some things here and there, try not to be disappointed. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Delegate Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first off, I need to apologize for the distraction earlier. Uh, you heard me talking to someone, I was the distraction, which is odd because on my screen, it showed me as muted. Hmm. But you could still I didn't hear, hear it. And, and I also, hear it. as you can see now, it shows me as a different person other than Marvin Holmes. I've got some real problems with my Zoom stuff going on here, and I'll straighten it out with OIS later. I was going to say, it sounds like a personal problem to me. So. <laughs> uh, housing, any... housing and real property. We're going to have a work session today and tomorrow. Oh, okay. uh, today, <clears throat> today, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have, I'd like to begin at 2.15 um, to give you some time frame to get another cup of coffee, et cetera. Housing and real property at 2.15. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other announcements? Uh, uh, from subcommittee chairs or from members of the co uh, committee in general. Okay, seeing none, uh, that's it. I, I guess we have uh, public hearings tomorrow, right, Trish? Yeah, yeah. we got, we got, yeah. okay, we got public hearings tomorrow. So I will see you all tomorrow at one o'clock. Um,